What's up, folks? Huge shout out to Kaden Gardner, the author of this series. He just released a webtoon video that's set in the same universe as this one. Make sure you go check it out and subscribe to his channel to show your support. I am Nemesis. The thought persisted in my head constantly. I am a weapon. I am a force. I exist to save the world. Or did I exist to serve the horseman of death? I was his instrument. His herald. His bitch? No, that wasn't right. He'd given me a second chance. But was it worth it? I'd killed so many people. I'd done so much harm. Guilt wasn't something I was accustomed to. Not until after I died anyway. We spent two days prepping for our operation into Deadfall. Based on files from Gideon Tower, we knew the place was warded to hell. Teleporting there would be impossible. We knew we'd have to come in by boat, which was problematic enough as it is with the human guards patrolling the ground. Deadfall itself was an oil wreck somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico, one that had been converted into a massive aquatic lab for Gideon and their scientific community. They had also done heaps of research and testing for Lazarus, which was why horsemen wanted it sunk. Approaching on boat guaranteed that we'd be spotted. We could have tried a smaller boat, but that would only get us caught by the revenant Titanoboa that patrolled the waters near it. During the time we'd been planning, I'd been keeping track of what Ophelia and her team had been up to. They'd managed to attack the ship as the Viz was using to link up to get a supplement of Great Valley Omega Serum to keep himself sane. They'd also managed to capture the man himself and locate Chat, who just happened to be on that fall. I'd have to go and save his ass too. There was one point while we were prepping that a thought occurred to me. Victor's an angel, right? I asked. He was a general in Heaven's armies. His name isn't actually Victor. It's unpronounceable in any human language. He just chose Victor because he liked the way it sounded. The horseman said as he stood ahead of me. I thought angels were supposed to be the good guys, I said. The horseman inhaled deeply. I'm gonna share with you a memory, he said right before touching my forehead. I was suddenly amongst a crowd of people. The air was brisk and smelled of burning meat. I could tell by what the people were wearing that they were peasants in some medieval European country. We were in a courtyard of some sort. There was a stage ahead of us where a beefy man with a massive double-sided axe stood next to a kneeling woman. Ahead of them was a skinny frail looking man draped in red ropes reading from a scroll. This woman has been found guilty of witchcraft by her most high priest and is therefore sentenced to death by beheading. The crowd had found themselves in a frenzy. They booed and jeered. Some even threw rotten fruits at the girl. The woman didn't waver though. She seemed resigned to her fate. Her blonde hair was tattered and blood. Her eye was blackened. She'd clearly put up a fight before her capture. The roped man turned back to her with a sneer. Have you any last words? He asked. The girl smirked. My fate is sealed. My soul will be in heaven before this day ends. Yours won't. The man knelt down to her, and despite the shouts of the crowd, I could hear him whisper. Your friends have abandoned you. You speak of a father who can't intervene. Your idle threats mean nothing to me. Then why do you look scared? She asked with a smile. The man stood up and motioned for the executioner to begin his work. He took a step forward and raised his axe. Then, in one swipe, he brought the blade whistling down, slicing the woman's head off in one clean swing. The head bounced off the stage and into the crowd, which parted as it rolled only coming to a stop when it hit my foot. A bright light suddenly flashed across the sky, a blinding white light accompanied by a very agonized scream. A beam slammed down hard into the wooden stage, shattering it into pieces. Splinters flew through the air along with a cloud of dust. 
The impact sent a shockwave to send the crowd around me flying. I stood there though, watched as the figure, a man in a white cloak, approached the head, dropping to a knee when he got to it. Victor cradled the girl's head in his arms for a moment. No, he sobbed. How could they? I knelt down before him, getting eye level. His tears fell onto the girl's lifeless head. Humans are strange. I started to speak, but the horseman's voice came out. They use God to justify their own malicious acts. They wonder why he hasn't come back since the crucifixion. They're not all evil though. Victor's eyes met mine. Why didn't you help her? He asked. You know why. Victor's face morphed into one of disgust. You're supposed to protect humanity. From world-ending threats, not power-hungry bishops, I replied. He killed my daughter, Victor shouted as he shot to his feet. And the hell hunters will stop him. Victor, you're emotionally unstable right now. You're not thinking straight, Horseman said. Not thinking straight? No, I'm thinking straighter than ever before, he said before suddenly vanishing. The next thing I knew, I was standing in the plane again. The horseman was sitting down at his computer. His daughter, I said softly, beheaded for being a witch on the orders of a bishop that was ironically under the influence of the Necronomicon at the time. We hadn't been able to prove that one yet though. Wouldn't he have gone to see her in heaven? I asked. Yeah, but it wasn't so much as the loss of her as the snuffing out of her life. She was half human, half angel, a Nephilim. Her death was unnecessary in the cosmic scale, and we all knew it, which is why we couldn't intervene. Victor showing up at the end would have gotten him locked away had the Hellhunters not been able to prove the bishop had been tainted. Hellhunters? I asked. Long story, said Horseman. Victor doesn't want to destroy humanity himself. That would be too easy. It would also be suicide on his part. Victor's more out to prove a point. He doesn't think humanity can be trusted with its own fate. He wants this weapon, Lazarus. He wants to give it to people who will use it. He wants humanity to prove to heaven that they're unworthy of the worlds they'd been given. So what's the plan? I asked as I watched the horseman type away on his computer. I'm working on it, he said. I was admittedly irritated. My friend was stuck in Victor's custody and probably being used in some kind of fucked up experiments. We could air drop you in, Horseman said. Halo jump you mean? I asked. He shrugged. A guy parachuting in would garner some attention, I replied. Whoever said anything about parachuting in? The horseman asked with a smirk. We did a little more research, looking over personal files and whatnot. Basic intelligence gathering. We didn't find anything major, other than two files, one on an assassin known as Anthony the Crow Gunk, who had been sent to beef up security. Apparently, the man had a grudge against me in particular, after I messed up his security team up at Gideon Tower. The other was a man I'd met before, Colonel Ivan Willis, or, as he was known in intelligence circles, Matt Ivan. I met Ivan initially in Grozny. He was the second in command of Gideon's security forces. He was formerly a member of the US Navy SEALs before a friendly fire incident killed him. Enter Victor and Gideon, and I'm sure you can guess the rest. As I said, I met the guy in Grozny. He was the guy Jamie had sold us out to. The one whose mercenary showed up and killed one of my agents before burning down the safe house down that Chad was inside of. He was on my shit list. He wouldn't be for very much longer. I stood at the edge of the plane's off-ramp, watching the sea way down below me. The horseman stood to my left with his hands in his pockets. I was nervous. I'd done a few halo jumps in the past, but never without a parachute. You, uh, you sure the suit can handle this? I asked. The horseman smirked. Mostly, he said. I took a deep breath as I read it myself. This was stupid, jumping out of a fully functional plane. Remember your assignment. Get in 
Initiate a self-destruct sequence. Get your friend, then leave. Got it? He asked. I nodded as I took a step off the ramp. Deathfall was just a speck in the blue ocean below me. I fell, moving faster and faster every second, the speck getting larger and larger. Until finally, I slammed into the facility roof. It hurt. When I say it hurt, I meant it hurt like a motherfucker. But the suit held fast. I'd never thought I'd be so happy to have fallen into concrete and steel. I rolled to my feet and raised my rifle. You know you could have landed on your feet, right? The horseman's voice said over comms. Fuck you, I said. I could hear the horseman chuckle. That was when I heard a voice. The sound came from up here, it said. I cloaked and started to step backward as a guard used the ladder to climb up onto the roof. He walked over to the crater I'd left and looked down at it. Did we get hit by a meteor? He asked. Another guard walked up behind him. It wasn't a meteor, you idiot. What else would leave a crater like this? He asked. It was probably falling debris from a plane. A meteor would have sank the place. When did you become a meteor expert? Asked the first guard. I exhaled as I turned and walked off from the two men arguing. That was when the call came through my comm link. Hey Trent, the CIA are en route to extract chat. Do me a favor and clear off the helipad so they can land without being shot at. Deathfall was a big place, but not big enough to where I couldn't see the helipad on the other side of the facility. I calmly approached the two other guards that were chatting on the helipad. You ever think they were just masked men that were sent to places to be cannon fodder for the main characters to tear through like paper mache? One asked. The other turned and looked at him with his head cocked to the side. Have you been doing LSD again? It got quiet for a second. Yeah, he replied. Damn it, Kruger, I told you. I stabbed one in the back and shot the other in the side of the head before tossing the bodies down into the rough ocean below. Two less problems to deal with. Now I had to find a way inside. I did so through an air vent, which was large enough to get through. The files said that the facility's self-destruct sequence could be started from a control console in one of the lower levels. I made my way to that level by shimmying through several air vents, eventually popping out in the same room. I had already been cloaked. I approached the computer, my suit doing its good work. I was in almost instantly. I had access to everything on site, including security feeds. I flipped the self-destruct sequence. The moment I did, all hell broke loose. Alarms blared. It was a timing matter now. The sequence would take 10 minutes to work, which meant I had 5 to go and grab chat and get him to his team up top. I started to make my way out of the room when a man in a lab coat came barging through the doorway. How the hell? He seemed confused as he walked up to the console and started typing numbers. I groaned under my breath as I lifted my pistol and shot him in the back of the head. His body fell to the floor. Then I adjusted my aim and fired into the console. I walked to the doorway and looked down at it. That was when I noticed the fingerprint scanner next to the doorway. I groaned again as I turned to the body. To my credit, it took me maybe four minutes to find Chad through a maze of whited out hallways and labs. I killed a few more guards along the way. Chad was standing there, bug-eyed, as a mercenary had a gun aimed at him. I decloaked right away behind the mercenary. Chad's eyes shot to me. The mercenary followed his gaze, turning around to see me. You a Star Wars fan? I asked as I ignited my sword. I didn't give him a second to answer before I lopped his head from his shoulders. His body fell, leaving Chad standing there staring at me with a mortified expression. Um, I'm 100% a Star Wars fan, he said with his hands up. Let's go, Mad Doc, I said as I turned and started walking down the hallway. He followed me until we made it to a steel doorway with a fingerprint lock. How are we going to get through that? He asked. I pulled the lab tech's severed finger from one of the magazine pouches on my belt and placed it on the lock. That's fucking disgusting, he said. The door opened, revealing a set of stairs. The exit should be this way. Your team is. I was interrupted by a loud crack. 
something hit the back of my head hard. My suit held. I turned to see who my assailant was, only to find a man clad in black tactical gear who wore a black boony hat and his face was covered by high-tech looking goggles and a black mask. He had two massive revolvers aimed at me. Get upstairs, I ordered Chad as I started walking away towards the man. To give the crow some credit, he fired his pistols faster than anyone I'd ever seen, but every round bounced off my armor. It took maybe three steps to close the distance. I lopped one of his arms off before kicking him in the center of his chest. The man went sailing into the nearest wall. He was out cold. How much time do I have left? I asked. Three minutes. How am I supposed to? I was interrupted by something blasting through the wall ahead of me. I stopped dead in my tracks as I stared into the black eyes of a zombified looking snake. That's a big ass snake, I said as the thing came flying down the hallway at me. The snake looked as one would expect a massive black python to look like, only its body must have been as thick as a large tree stump. Its head was the size of a shopping cart and missing skin on one side of his face. I turned and began to run the other way, but it caught up to me faster than I'd been ready for, coiling its body around me before clenching down on me with its massive jaws. It all happened so fast. The next thing I knew, it had already swallowed me. I still had my sword, but I couldn't lift my arm high enough to use it. The creature itself was already dead, so it didn't feel any pain when I ignited the weapon. So I went with my next best option. I let go of the sword and reached for a grenade on my belt. The inside of the creature smelled like rotten and decayed fish. It honestly made me want to gag. It looked even worse, especially through my hood. It took a lot of effort to get my thumb around the pin of a grenade, but I did. Then I pulled it. The explosion sent me flying out of one of the snake's sides and into a wall. I struggled to get to my feet, only to find the snake was face to face with me, now missing a good portion of its throat. I reached out my hand and called my sword back just as it sneered back to strike. Call it skill, luck, whatever you want. But I shoved the sword through the top of the beast's mouth and into its brain. The beast fell to the floor. I stood there for a second, trying to comprehend. How did that thing find me? I asked. You got less than two minutes before this place goes up. Get outside. Horseman said into our comlink. Did Chad make it? I asked. He'll be fine. I did as told, sprinting down the winding hallways and up the stairs just in time to come across Matt Ivan himself as he bashed in Revenant's head with his pistol. There was a large gaping hole in the side of his neck, almost like he'd been bitten by something, or someone. He exhaled as he got to his feet. He turned and glanced at me over his black sunglasses. His bald head and green beard were covered in specks of blood and brain matter. He smiled widely. You, you're the one who's been raiding our facilities, he said as he got to his feet. I looked down at the body right below him. He seemed to follow my gaze. Oh that? That's Janet. She, uh, she had an accident, got herself infected with a test batch and died. I raised my pistol at him. He didn't really react to this. He only smiled at me. I could feel my heart rate escalating as my brain played the images of this man. His laugh as Jamie unloaded his pistol into my chest. I'd been shot in the initial exchange with his men. Finding myself sitting up against the CIA battle van. A wound in my chest. Blood leaking from my mouth. When a black SUV rolled up, I wasn't going to sit there. Chad was in cover and in the barn behind me. We'd been separated during the exchange. I knew exactly who they were, Gideon security forces. My only real question was, how had they tracked us? Matt Ivan himself stepped out of the SUV, wearing the exact same smile that he was wearing now. Damn kid, you don't look so good. That was what he said to me, right before Jamie showed himself. And well, you all know what happened next. There was a bit more conversing of course. But you get the gist. I got shot. I didn't want to waste a moment. Matt Ivan stood across from me, his eyes bloodshot and his wound beginning to bubble. He had been infected with the Revenant pathogen, but he hadn't died yet. 
I kept my pistol in the room. Who are you anyway? Ivan asked. Damn kid, you don't look so good. I said almost mockingly. Ivan's eyes widened in realization. His smile seemed to grow. I remember you. Good, I said as I in my pistol and fired around straight into his skull. Nemesis, you have 20 seconds. Horseman said into my comms. I didn't even get a chance to take in the comment. I took off in a full sprint toward the surface whilst trying to pull my helmet back on. I barely made it outside when a rip blew, the explosion sending me sailing into the ocean. I hit the water hard. Next thing I knew, I was teleported into the armory, my suit soaking wet and my whole body hurting from the explosion in the ocean. I lay there for a minute. The horseman stood over me with his hands on his hips. You okay? He asked. I held up a finger before looking up at him. I yanked my helmet off and coughed hard. Are you in pain? I thought this suit was supposed to be indestructible, I said. It is, but you my friend are not. I groaned as I sat up. The horseman helped me to my feet. I've got some security footage to show you, whenever you're ready, he said. As it turned out, he had footage of Chad escaping. Ophelia had come on a helicopter and pulled him out, which was honestly a relief. But that wasn't what Horseman wanted me to see. What he wanted to show me was the footage of Jamie, Ivan and Chad standing in the lab. Well, Chad wasn't exactly standing, more like cuffed and leaning against the wall. They were looking at a vat of a familiar looking crimson liquid. I couldn't hear the audio, but I audibly gasped when Ivan very suddenly pulled his revolver and shot Jamie in the chest with it. Jamie fell down dead, then Ivan and Chad exited the room while several men in lab coats recovered the body. The footage followed them as they opened the vat and stuffed Jamie's body inside. A few hours later, in the footage, a familiar looking man came into the room with several mercenaries behind him. It wasn't Ivan. It wasn't the crow. It was Victor Marks himself, clad in his white suit and maroon tie. The mercenaries took the vet on his orders. I wasn't sure where to, at least, not until Horseman spoke up. When Jamie wakes up, what use do you think Victor would have for him? It didn't take long for me to figure out the answer to that. The location of the CIA safe houses in the Paris area, I said sternly. Horseman nodded. How long do we have? I asked. I'm not sure. But I know that Shaw is sending Ophelia's team to go and recover the stones. But you're not sure how long they'll take to mobilize? So you need me to go and provide protection for them. Look at the brain on you, Mr. Grayson. Wouldn't that compromise my identity? I asked. Keep your mask on, and it won't be a problem. I shrugged. You said their Omega Serum was incomplete, right? Is there a chance it doesn't work? Horseman took a deep breath. The files from Death's file system indicate that the batch they used on Jamie is as close to pure as they can get. Victor's own blood played a hand in that. Fuck, I said. I didn't get a real chance to rest, as I had to reprep and be deployed to Paris. I was teleported to an alleyway that was maybe 200 yards away from the entrance to the safe house, which itself was technically in the basement of a nearby warehouse with a secret tunnel exit that led to a nearby field. I made my way through the alleyway finding myself at the entrance to the warehouse basement. My hut went to work, scanning the entrance. It had some kind of x-ray vision that enabled me to see through the door and into the entrance, where David Stone sat in a chair with a shotgun in his lap. I smirked as my suit began dialing the number on the phone I'd given him. He looked surprised as he pulled it from his jacket and put it to his ear. Hello? He asked. I'm coming in. Don't shoot me on accident. I said. I opened the door and came down the ladder that led straight down into the entrance, only to find David and Grace waiting at the bottom for me. I thought Shaw was sending a team. David asked. The team is too far out, and the safe house is compromised. You are stuck with me until they get here. I said as I walked past them and into one of the bedroom areas. The safe house itself was set up like a two-bedroom apartment, only it was underground 
and had to be accessed by either the ladder at the entrance or the tunnel system in the back. Have you accessed the tunnel system yet? I asked, already knowing the answer. Tunnel system? Asked David. I exited the master bedroom and walked into the bathroom, where I found a captured mercenary tied up in the shower. The bathroom floor was also slick with water. It looked like they were keeping the men as uncomfortable as possible. It was working too, as the men looked miserable. I looked down at all the water. You guys know the CIA has to pay the water bill for this place, right? If the CIA is paying, then I don't care, David said. That's actually pretty funny, I said. I reached over the men and pulled the shower head down. As I did so, the back wall of the shower suddenly came up, revealing a dark, rocky tunnel that led to another exit. Taro laughed when I did this. Stay here, I said. I'll go make sure the tunnels are clear. I walked into the darkened tunnel, my hut displaying its night vision mode. I could see all. I also had gotten a notification as soon as I entered the entrance to the safe house that the tunnels had been breached, which was why I went in alone. It took me a minute to reach the culprits, a team of Gideon security forces soldiers, all of which had night vision. But that didn't help them as much as I still had my cloaking ability. I cut them down before they knew I was there. That was when I got the notification that the other door had been breached. I turned to start running back down the tunnels when a rope lowered from the entrance behind me. I turned to see another squad of mercenaries fast rope inside. Shit, I grumbled. I cut these mercenaries down as fast as I could. By the time I was yanking my sword from the last one, the tunnel had suddenly began shaking. My eyes widened as I realized what had happened. I turned into cough in a full sprint back towards the safe house, only to come to a sliding stop when I found Grace. She was staring at the rubble with a horrified expression on her face. I could hear her sob. The priest was trying his best to calm her down, hugging her closely. I knew what had happened. David had planted explosives in the safe house as a contingency. I was kicking myself that I couldn't get back in time. Grace? We need to go, the priest, Father Raphael said softly. My heart ached for the girl. I wanted to give her a minute to get her head on, but we quite frankly didn't have time. I did the only thing I could think of at the moment. I took off my helmet and put my hand on her shoulder. Grace, I started softly. Listen to me, we need to get out of here, or it would have all been for nothing, okay? Grace sobbed a bit more. We all stood there for a second, her sobs being the only thing we could hear in the tunnel. That was until there were suddenly footsteps behind me. I was about to raise my weapon and turn. Then I realized something. I knew those footsteps. My eyes widened as my heart began to race. Trent? Her voice asked. I turned to her slowly. I could see the mixture of elation, confusion, and anger on her face. I wanted to run to her, I wanted to hold her, to kiss her, but I had a job to do. Agent Wild, we need to get this young lady to safety, I said sternly. Ophelia had seen me use that tone before. I knew she wanted to talk more, but she bit her tongue. She knew what I was thinking. The mission, then maybe we could have an explanation. Okay, she said. I pulled my helmet back on. What have you done? Horseman's voice asked into my mask. My audio had been muted to everyone around me. I, uh, I know what it's like to lose a parent. I didn't think. You compromised everything. Horseman said aggressively, before taking a deep breath. But given the circumstances, I understand. Go with them. Ensure the girl stay safe. Yes, sir. About an hour later, we were on an airstrip. Shaw himself waited for us at the top of a ramp connected to the back of a C-17. I didn't know how to feel when I saw him. He seemed genuinely happy to see me though, even if his face didn't show it. Raphael and I guided Grace up the ramp. Trent? Shaw greeted as we walked past him. 
I could hear the familiar footsteps storming up behind me. I couldn't help but crack a smile under my mask. Better watch out, I replied. I got a look just over my shoulder as Ophelia attacked Shaw in his face. His glasses went sailing onto the ramp. You son of a bitch, how could you? She demanded. Chad now close behind her. Ophelia? Not now. Chad said softly. Shaw wiped his now bloody lip. Ophelia had another swing ready to go, but she lowered her fist and walked past them, leaving Shaw and Chad standing there. I'll explain when we get to the Reagan. You fucking better, Chad said. We used a specially made blanket to mask Grace from the satellite. I spent most of the flight looking at the floor, still mentally kicking myself that I couldn't get back fast enough to pull David out. I even had my hut pull the security footage so I could see what had happened. It went something like this. The camera in the entranceway caught the steel entrance door flying to the entranceway from the top of the ladder. A smoke grenade landed shortly after. I could hear David's voice. Shit! He called out. Cut to the bedroom. David is shutting a sliding steel door. He's looking at Raphael, who is the only one in there with him. Grace is in the bathroom with the prisoner. We will get to that later. The steel doorway is suddenly dented inward. David has a shocked expression. He looks at Raphael. Get Grace to the tunnels. What will you do? Raphael asks. I'll catch up. Raphael goes into the bathroom to get Grace. The steel door is violently kicked in. There's a silhouette in the doorframe amongst the smoke. Mr. Stone. It says, sinisterly. David doesn't hesitate as he raises his double barrel and fires. The silhouette flies into the room faster than a human eye can track, knocking the shotgun from David's hands. It's a vampire. A brutal one at that. David deploys a silver sleeve blade and tries to stab it, but it catches him by his wrist with one hand while shoving a dagger into his shoulder with the other. You've gotten slow, old man. The vampire sneers before tossing David into a nearby wall. David gets to his feet, all the while coughing up blood. The vampire, cockily, walking towards him. This was around the time the horseman's voice broke in. That's Jackson Helsing. Or Jackson Tippis now. He took his wife's last name. Tippis? I almost laughed. David, David, David. I must say, I admire your fight. Always have. You could have made a fantastic member of the Black Guard had Anna chosen to turn you. But she didn't. Instead, you two conceived your abomination. Jackson said. David tries to swing his blade at him again, but Jackson decked under it and shoved his dagger into David's chest. I could feel my heart rate escalate. Jackson was face to face with David, who was trying to say something as the blood started leaking into his lungs. Last words? Jackson asked. She, she's not an abomination. She's fucking perfect. David said as he lifted one of his hands, revealing a switch that also just happened to be a detonator. The screen went black, leaving me inside my dark helmet. The whole exchange had lasted less than a minute. If I'd been faster, I could have saved them. I'd already killed a few vampires. You did your job, Trent. She's safe, Horseman said. I took a deep breath, my helmet going back to where I could see in front of me, where a pair of Desert 10 size 14 combat boots stood in front of me. I looked up at Chad, who was staring down at me. I took a deep breath. I suppose you want answers? Omega? He asked. Kind of. Not the one Estevez got though. Mine was pure. Chad took a deep breath. Why didn't you let us know you were alive? You could have called. Left a note. Something. It wasn't allowed. Bullshit. We stared at each other for a second. I took a deep breath. Now wasn't the time for arguing. Chad. You've got no idea the forces that are at play right now. Once powerful enough to bring the dead back to life, I saw your fucking body, dude. It's more than just that. You saw Lazarus in action at that fall. The final product will be much worse. Lazarus? Asked Raphael. I turned to him. 
It's what they need Grace for. Her blood is the key to the final mutation. It's a bioweapon. One built to cause terror. It got quiet again. I could feel my eyes drifting to Ophelia. She was staring into nothing. Just like I had been. It made my heart ache even worse. She was hurting, and there was nothing I could do. I felt helpless. More helpless than I'd ever felt before I was murdered. The old Trent would have known what to say to her. I think Chad seemingly noticed my staring. Are you going to talk to her? She's pretty shaken up. Eventually, yes, but not right now. Trent. Trent is dead, I said. I'm all that's left. I said more to myself than anything. I'm not sure I realized I'd said it out loud. The USS Reagan was built with the intention of having those who see it getting it confused with the USS Ronald Reagan. It was a completely classified project. It was the most advanced supercarrier in the world. The place was practically a floating city. It had even its own hospital. It was twice as large as the Ronald Reagan. It could hold almost double the aircraft. It also had an assortment of firepower that I won't get into now. Our team had operated out of that ship for two years. We'd gotten to know the crew quite well. We even had a CIA-sanctioned control room in one of the lower decks. It was one of those rooms that was very Hollywood-esque, with the rows of people and computers and a massive screen on one wall. We were in this control room when the fireworks started. Ophelia had unloaded on Shaw verbally. I'd be lying if I said I didn't miss her spunk. Plausible deniability? That's horseshit and you know it. She barked. Agent Wild, calm yourself. He retorted. Calm yourself? You hit Trent being alive from her for a month. And all you have to say is, calm yourself? Shaw took a deep breath. Like I said, we needed someone who could go after Gideon that wasn't on our team. If Jones finds out that we orchestrated the robbery in Grasny, it shut us down. The room got quiet. We all knew Shaw was right, of course. It didn't make Ophelia and Chad feel any better, though. They have their hooks in everyone. The further we kept this from you guys, the better. This is Gideon. It's not chasing a militia with a bioweapon, and it's not the Estevez cartel. Nemesis enabled us to play actual offense. I was leaning on the doorframe watching the argument, knowing full well that Ophelia wasn't done yet. You still could have told us he was alive, she growled. That was when Horseman suddenly appeared in between them. Enough, he said in a slightly raised voice that made the whole room go silent. Except for an even more annoyed Ophelia. Who the hell are you? She demanded. I straightened myself up. I was now standing next to Shaw and behind the horseman. I am the first horseman. The horseman of death. I am the one who brought Trent back from the dead. Ophelia turned and looked at Chad. Chad shrugged. Right, Chad said. The horseman looked around. This whole thing has been a game played by forces beyond your understanding. It's complicated and deadly to say the least. Victor Marx has to be stopped. If not, the world will burn. We've currently got the advantage. We have to grow. But make no mistakes, Victor will respond. This seemed to quiet the room. I could see Ophelia staring at me. I could see the want in her eyes. But there wasn't anything I could do. Not until the job was done. The horseman turned to me. A word, he said before snapping his fingers. We were teleported to the top deck of the ship. The sun was rising in the distance. The ship rocked gently. I took a deep breath. What now? I asked. As if answering my question, Raziel, one of the three angels from earlier, appeared before me. Abel? He greeted as he looked at the horseman. Raziel? He replied. The Lightbender Temple harboring Hector Morales is under attack. Unsurprising, the horseman replied. I have rain gathering the survivors. Her son is among them. Her son? Asked Horseman. Yes, 
He was the light bender that protected Hector Morales during his assassination attempt. It would seem that Morales raised him, which is strange to say the least. As a Nephilim, his powers should have activated when he was 16, but they didn't. Not until one of the temple's warriors tried to kill him. Why? asked Horseman. From what the Grandmaster told us, and what we can piece together, Rain's son killed a lightbender called Simon after he robbed Morales. Aisha was sent to investigate and enact justice, but she just happened to show up at the same time as a Gideon assassin, a rogue god called Raiden. I'm sure you can guess the rest. The Grandmaster was more concerned about a rogue god than Rain's son. They took the son and Morales into their protection. They were at Gideon Tower looking for answers when Nemesis encountered them, but we knew that already. I didn't realize the assassin was a rogue god. Horseman said. Raziel nodded. We didn't know the exact details until Grandmaster Nigel debriefed us, only that he had a light bender on his security detail. Send the survivors here. We can interrogate them, provide medical aid, then maybe they can assist us in the coming battle. Raziel nodded and then disappeared. Horseman turned to me. I was honestly worried that he was about to tear into me for getting my cover blown. You think the last month has been hard. The battle's just beginning, he said. Well, it wasn't ever supposed to be easy, was it? I asked. The horseman just smirked at me. If all goes well, you may get a happy ending out of this. You're not a bad person, Trent. I sighed. I'm whatever I need to be. He took a deep breath. Did he call you Abel? I asked. The horseman laughed. Yeah, yeah he did. No wonder you just go by horseman. The horseman ignored this as he looked out at the ocean. The sun was semi up at this point. He seemed to admire it, almost like he thought it was peaceful. I on the other hand, was still ready for my nap that I knew wasn't coming anytime soon. I've been around since the dawn of men. I've seen species go extinct and empires rise and fall. I've seen floods and volcanoes wipe out whole civilizations. Diseases melt the flesh of millions and wars destroy even more. But humanity always gets back up from the ashes. That's what I love about them. Their perseverance. The sun always comes up and find them waiting for its warmth. I dread the day the sun comes up to find the life extinguished. I took a deep breath as I considered the words. Honestly, sir, I'm still sore from that fucking snake. He eyed me before vanishing. That was when they appeared. The female lightbender from earlier, whose name was Aisha. A man I recognized as Hector Morales. The male lightbender, Rochette a wounded old lightbender who I guess was Grandmaster Nigel. And then the last one, the younger man that made my hut go crazy with an angelic energy detection. He had a sword strapped to his back, a sword with a dragon on the hilt. He was tall and lean. I guessed that he was Wayne's child. The whole group looked battered and torn. Nigel looked like he was about to die. Rochette was barely able to hold him up. My heart identified that his ribs were broken on one side and that his lung was collapsed. My eyes locked on Aisha. So glad you could join us. We got Nigel to the medical area. I got the story from a now much friendlier Aisha that Gideon's security forces had come upon their temple in the dead of night. That they'd killed most of the members inside. Nigel had been attacked by Raiden himself. Raiden being the Japanese god of thunder and Nigel being the grandmaster of the temple. Their fight shouldn't have been as one-sided as it was. Nigel would have been dead if not for the intervention of Keith, Rain's son. Why an angel of the Lord named her child Keith, you ask? Who knows? Poor kid. I did a background check on Keith. Call me crazy, but something was strange about him. What I learned was that he joined the Marines out of high school, only to be kicked out for stabbing a superior officer in the chest with a pen. Before the Marines, Hector Morales has been his legal guardian after Keith's father, a Cuban immigrant whose first name was unavailable, but his last name was Gonzalez, went missing. 
It was assumed that it was because of a plane crash, but who really knows? As for Keith, he did some time in a military prison and was dishonorably discharged. This was around the same time that Hector's Bioware company had started making ground. Keith was brought in by his pseudo-father as private security. From there, the record isn't exactly squeaky clean. Keith seems to have been a suspect in several missing person and murder cases, mostly in New York City. If I were to guess, I'd say he was doing hits on the side. He was never formally charged, of course. A few hours later, I found myself standing in the control room, Ophelia Shanchet standing across from me. We all knew we currently held the advantage with Grace being on the ship. We all knew Victor would do something in response. We didn't know what. Not yet. But maybe, just maybe, we could go on the offensive. From how I see it, you've got two options. Play keep away with the girl, or try and figure out Gideon's next move. I'd be willing to bet they're going to try and force our hand. I said. Can you take the mask off? It's hard to understand you with it on. Ophelia asked. I knew what she was doing. She wanted to see my face. She knew if she did, that I wouldn't be able to hide behind my mask. I took a deep breath. No, it's not. But, whatever. I said as I pulled the helmet off. What's the call? I asked. Hector Morales said that they took his daughter. He's on our boat. I don't know about you, but that sounds like leverage to me. We need to get her back. I don't want him doing something stupid on my ship, Shaw said. I'd be more worried about Estevez. The dude may be locked up, but he does have a super soldier serum in him, replied Chad. Shaw nodded. I'll double the guard in the brick. We need to know all the places Gideon Security takes their high-value prisoners, especially if we're going after Hector's daughter, I said, thinking that this would have been easier if we could get back on Gideon's mainframe. A voice broke me out of my trance. I know someone who may be able to help. We all turned to see Grace standing at the doorway. She looked sullen, but more so angry. Angry that her father was taken from her. I could tell what she was thinking. She wanted payback. Who? asked Shaw. Our prisoner. Terrell. I let him go. I, uh... Gideon kills their own men when they're compromised. Who's Terrell? My suit records everything. As soon as I heard the name, his image appeared on my hut. A holographic image of Terrell locked up in the shower appeared right above my wrist. I watched as Chad's face lit up like a Christmas tree. No fucking way, Chad said. What? I asked, already thinking I knew the answer. That is, or was Rachel's handler? He's MI6. I guess I better do another information dump. Early on in Chad's career with the CIA, Chad met a redhead girl at a bar in San Diego. From how he tells the story, she asked him for his number, and a year later, they were married. She didn't know he was in the CIA until they tied the knot. Then a few weeks later, we're on a mission in Mogadishu, where we're supposed to meet an MI6 liaison. Guess who it was? If you thought the answer was Rachel Davis, Chad's beloved wife, you'd be correct. That mission was tense for a whole cascade of reasons that I won't get into at the moment. But you catch the drift. Chad completely ghosted her. I mean, who wouldn't? There wasn't a lot of trust left in that relationship. He took a couple weeks off after that mission. We all did, for varying reasons. He went and did a whole investigation himself. I guess he wanted answers. I never really asked about it, but it's funny how life works out. That explains why the horseman made me spare him. Can you call Rachel? I really don't want to, Chad replied. That's not what you told the zombie lady. You, uh, you heard that? Chad asked. I'll have Mikhail see if we have any files on him. I'll get on the line with MI6, even though they're probably compromised, just as bad as we are. Chad? You know what you gotta do. Ophelia cut in as she turned to a computer and started to type. I could see Chad's face falter a bit. Ugh, fine. 
Chad walked out of the room. I stood there with a smirk on my face as I watched him leave. I could feel Shaw's eyes burrowing into the side of my head. What did you mean zombie lady? He asked. The holographic image switched from Terrell to Chad being locked up in a lap at that fall. A revenant banging on the glass from another lap. This revenant wore a lap coat with the name Janet written on it. Chad had his back to the glass and looked more bored than anything. I know, I know. I shouldn't worry about her. But she was my wife. Chad said. The revenant replied in a low groan. Chad turned and looked up at the zombie. His face annoyed. No, she was great as a wife. Granted, the whole MI6 thing kinda killed the relationship. The revenant again let off another groan. You're right, Janet. I should call her. It got quiet as Chad thought for a second. He took a deep breath. You know, you give horrible advice. I can't call Rachel. Do you know how much trouble I get in? Shaw would eat my ass for breakfast. The revenant looked at him for a moment before trying to bite down on the glass. No, not like that, you pervert. That was when the footage stopped, leaving Shaw and Ophelia standing there with two very different expressions on their faces. Ophelia looked concerned, while Shaw looked slightly embarrassed. It was hard to get the audio, but I'm glad I did, I said, trying not to smirk. We need to get him to see a psychiatrist, Shaw said. No, he misses his wife, Ophelia said. MI6 got back with Ophelia rather quickly, telling Ophelia that after Terrell had escaped, he'd gone and reported in at a safe house a few miles south of Mondeville, so we prepped up to get ready and go in. The plan was simple, go in, get him and get out. If Gideon security forces hadn't gotten to him already, we organized a strike team, which consisted of me, Chad, Ophelia, Aisha, Keith, Ray and Miguel. It took everyone a minute to prep. While they did, I watched security footage of the Reagan's brick. There, Carlos Estevez was sitting in a cell with the men that had helped Ophelia and her team escape the prison. A man who happened to be his brother, who he left to rot in that godforsaken place. Juan Estevez watched as his brother rocked back and forth in his seat, mumbling about how he needed his supplement. I only exhaled as I shut off the screen. I didn't want to watch that. An analyst in the control room perked up as he turned to Shaw. Uh, sir, we've got an approaching aircraft. Who is it? Asked Shaw. It's Deputy Director Jones. Shit, Shaw said as he turned and abruptly walked out of the room. The name did pique my interest. I had only met the Deputy Director a few times. I didn't know much about him. Other than he'd been the head of SNOD and had it shut down when Shaw was about to take over. According to Horseman, it was because Shaw wanted to open an investigation into Gideon. I cloaked and stood at the doorway to the control room, knowing that they'd be back. Sure enough, about three minutes later, Jones came marching down the hallway with Shaw on his tail. You're going to turn over custody of Estevez to me as well as custody of the agents involved in the fiasco in Mexico. Are we clear? Jones demanded. I could tell by Shaw's heart rate that he wasn't enjoying the conversation, but he didn't really have another choice. Fine, but let me go talk to them first. You know the SAD guys. They're gonna want to fight. Don't do anything funny. I'll have your ass arrested too. Understood. I decloaked and walked into the room behind him. Hello, director. The director had a confused look on his face. Who is this? I'm curious. Gideon buys most of their politicians off with free easy pills. But my heart's toxicology screening of you doesn't indicate that you have any in your system. How they buy you off? Jones's jaw lowered a bit. Excuse me? He asked. I could hear his heart rate escalate. You hurt me. Who the hell are you? Just an asset, I said. He's the horseman's Shaw Karen. Jones turned and looked at Shaw. 
What? Both Jones and I asked at the same time. You hurt me, Shaw said. Jones seemed to take a second to gather his thought. He looked in disbelief. He looked confused. No, he said he wouldn't. Not after. He did. And he did because of Gideon. Jones considered this for a second before shaking his head. It doesn't matter. I've got orders. Now you do too. I left this conversation and very quickly headed down to the staging area, which was almost locker room-esque. I told them all what had just happened. We knew what our mission was. I also knew that Ayesha had cubes that could enable all of us to teleport straight to our target. She tossed the cubes, and a portal crafted from golden energy appeared. The seven of us walked through as Shaw entered the room. I could see him smile at me as the portal closed. I couldn't imagine what excuse he was going to tell Jones, but I didn't care. We had a job to do. We arrived at the safe house Terrell had supposedly been at. It was a meager brick house, small with a short driveway that had a truck in the front. The moment we made it through the portal, Ophelia turned and threw up in the grass. We all kind of looked at her for a moment. Are you okay? I asked. She looked up at me. Yeah, that made me nauseous. I'm good now. The house was on the edge of town, so it was secluded from most of the people in the area. I motioned for Aisha and Keith to approach the front door, while Ophelia and I went around the house towards the back. Chad had found a nearby hill to perch up on with his M14, while Ray and Miguel took cover behind the truck. I could hear Keith and Aisha on the comm link. Do we knock? Keith asked. Do I look like I fucking know? Aisha asked. You cuss a lot, replied Keith. You've barely heard me cuss. Rashad tells me you do. I rolled my eyes. From what I'd heard, these two hated each other. Now they sounded like Ophelia and I when we first met. We're going around back, I said, hoping it stopped their conversation. I'm in position, Chad's voice said into comms. We were at the side of the house now. I had my rifle raised ahead of me. We were approaching a wooden fence that led to a backyard. It's almost like old times, Ophelia whispered. How so? I asked. You? Me? A potential gunfight? So romantic. I wanted to chuckle at that, but we needed to be serious now. Focus Agent Wild, I said. That was weird. Moving in. I heard Keith's voice over the comm link. I wondered what he meant by that as we pushed the fence open and made our way into the backyard. We found the back door and approached it cautiously. I looked at Ophelia, who nodded as I reached to open it. That was when I heard the call. That made my blood run cold. I've got eyes on Victor. Keith's voice called out. I rammed the door open with my shoulder and shot inside, Ophelia close behind me. We found them in a hallway. Keith was getting to his feet, yanking the sword from his back. It began to glow an almost blinding white color, his eyes wide as well as they locked onto Victor, who stood there calmly, his back to me. Aisha was on the ground below Keith. She looked like she was in pain. Victor himself made my hut go insane. Angelic essence detected. I'm gonna kill you! Keith bellowed as he charged in. The Twilight Blade? Where'd you get that? Victor asked as Keith charged him. I pulled my sword and went for Victor's back. Keith and I reached him at roughly the same time. I readied myself to stab the man in his lower back, but he vanished before my sword touched him. I barely managed to stop it from going into Keith, who had likewise barely stopped his twilight sword from hitting my helmet. Where'd he go? I asked. I don't know, Keith replied. Victor reappeared behind Keith and slammed his head into a wall. I pulled my pistol and opened fire, but the bullet did nothing but bounce off. Victor looked at me with a sinister grin. 
Trent Grayson, we finally meet. Keith went limp as he fell to the ground. You're talented, he said, but weak. He vanished and reappeared in front of me, grabbing my suit and launching me into the nearest wall. I flew through the drywall and into the next room. I could see the bullets from Ophelia's rifle hitting Victor. He didn't look amused. Please, he sneered. He was suddenly hit in the back of the head by Aisha's spear. But this didn't even bother him as he turned and snatched her by the throat and lifted her up, reaching into a pouch on her waist and pulling her cubes out. The same cubes she used to open portals to teleport from place to place. I hope you don't need these, he said before crunching them in his hand. No! Aisha screamed loudly. Victor turned and slammed Aisha into the now charging in Ophelia. I got to my feet as Victor started to walk towards the front door, only to get shot by Miguel and Ray from behind the truck. You're gonna need a lot more than that to kill me, Victor said. Keith had come to and gotten to his feet. He had the sword in his hands and was approaching Victor from behind, the sword burning brightly as he did so. He brought it whistling down at Victor, who casually turned and caught it with an outstretched hand. Keith stood there for a moment as he strained with the sword. Victor just smirked. My heart zoomed in on his hand that was clutching Keith's blade. It was bleeding. Interesting, he said. Victor vanished, leaving Keith still standing there. I walked over to where Ophelia was laying and pulled her to her feet. Aisha was on a knee behind her. I helped Ophelia out the front door, where Keith was still standing with a confused look in his face. What was that? He asked. A trap, I replied. It took me an hour before I managed to reach the horseman. He arrived with a semi-shocked look in his face. A look I don't think I've ever seen on him. Where have you been? I asked. Trent, the girl. What about the girl? I asked. He snapped his fingers. We found ourselves on the Reagan, where the smell of blood and smoke infested the air. There were men loading bodies into body bags. A sullen feeling came over me. I didn't need to ask. I knew what happened. The trap was a distraction. Now, we were gonna have to learn what the consequences were.